Good afternoon, thank you very much for coming. This is being recorded video and sound wise. Uh, the video camera does not show anyone, so no worries. It will be then available put up on YouTube. Uh, if you ask questions, you don't want your voice to be recorded, do let me know and I'll remove it for final editing. Okay? So this is a joint presentation organized by uh, Iconia and Lacanian Works. Most of you know about Lacanian Works. Iconia is a research group uh, started by Richard Dunbrill and Irving, Irving Finkel, perhaps. Richard wants to tell, you, to tell us a few words about Iconia, what it does. Yeah, Iconia is a research group which is uh, uh, hosted at the University of London at the School of Advanced Study. Uh, um, um, uh, we are not a teaching institution, but we are a research center where people from around the world can come and study this new science of archaeomusicology, that is the science of music in the ancient world, but mainly in the ancient world where it started. It was in Mesopotamia, so it involves the uh, research in uh, Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian, Assyrian, uh, and more recent material. Uh, we, are, we have scholars from all around the world and students from around the world. Uh, a new student of mine is coming from uh, Colombia, Venezuela, uh, next week to have a, a course with us. We give a conference every year, usually in London, but it can be as well. Uh, we, uh, we work with Iraq. I'm going to Iraq in uh, about 10 days for the Babylon Festival, of which I'm an organizer. And uh, uh, you know, we we work in the restoration, in the in the reconstruction of musical instruments, in the cuneiform tablets dealing with the theory of music, of which we have more than uh, uh, Greeks have, sadly, because our material is is of the period at which it was created. Whilst the Greek material has been uh, transmitted sometimes by very difficult uh, uh, methods. Uh, that doesn't mean it is not reliable, it means that it is uh, simply less uh, 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 credible than, than the language. This is it. I mean, if you want to ask me about Iconia uh, later, you will be welcome, but we are speaking today about music and totemism. And I also have to thank Dimitri for agreeing to be the computer operator because we don't have a projector, so I will be coding our pictures and you will be able to see them on the computer here. So, yes, indeed. I'm talking about, uh, I'm going to be talking about music and totemism, and of course, if we are talking about totemism, we have to go into Freud, and if we go into Freud, we might as well go into Lacan. So I think everyone here is aware of my Freudian Lacanian position, so I don't need to explicit it, really. Except there's something I would like to outline, remember, as per the Freudian texts, we're talking about unconscious, pre-conscious and the conscious three terms. The second term, the pre-conscious, is very often forgotten. So those three terms. And later on, Freud will turn them into the id, the ego, and the superego. And he makes a very important proviso with regards to the ego. The ego is both is a surface and it is both an inside and an outside. That's very important. The ego is also partially unconscious. That's also very important. And the fact that the ego is not that differentiated from the id is one of the sources of all our difficulties and neuroses. So this is the context from which I'm going to approach a, uh, an attempt to situate the origin of music in relation to totemism. And this word music is a difficult word. Don't think Madonna, because I'm going to be talking about mythical times, totemism, mythical times, a historic times. And that word music does not appear until the 12th century. And it designates a very particular practice which took about 400 years to stabilize. So when talking about music and totemism, I'm not going to talk about Madonna or the Beatles or Mozart. I have no idea what I'm going to do, why I'm covering this word music, but that's the only word I've got at the moment. If somebody wants to formulate another word which would cover the sound practices 
which used to take place in those difficult times, but they were cooked. Ritualistic sound. No, we have to... <laughs> no. <laughs> because we have not yet posed the totem. Ah. We first need the totem in place. Yes. To then have a ritual. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's no term in Greek. The are terms in Babylonian. The zameru, uh, zamara, was all to do with the making of music, the composing, the doing of it, especially in ritual, uh, in the temple, and certainly during the Shimon period, in, with totemistic intentions. So, everyone is clear about this Freudian Lacanian position I'm talking from in Bern yourself because you've attended, you're attending other seminars with uh, Benny. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Can I just add yeah. something? Uh, I just remember that in uh, uh, La Planche and Pontelis, um Precy of Freud, they quote him with regard to this great turning point of describing the ego in the 1920s that Freud conceives of the ego as largely unconscious. Yeah. Not just yeah. partly, but largely. largely yes. Yeah. Which is an astonishing yeah. discovery, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. It's it changed the world. It has uh, a very important consequences, such as we're exploring in our reading group, Seminar 7 on Seminar 7, which took place this morning, for instance. Yeah. Uh, please do interject, do comment as we go along, don't wait for the end. Yeah. So, what I'm going to try to do is an intersection between Archive of musicology, psychoanalysis, musicology, uh, anthropology, ethnology. And in intersection, if you remember your math classes, during which I'm sure you were all very attentive, an intersection consists in taking two sets and join them. And the notation in modern Set theory is like this, A union B. Okay. Mathematics stop there, and I contend that actually, instead of getting two elements conjoined, we get three. The intersection there. And I also contend that retroactively, this union changes the initial elements themselves. And that's in accordance with the Freudian theory of the psychical being both a container and a content. The container acts on the content, the content acts on the container, so we're not in a position of subject-object. And this is very important there. This is so important that it created something in the 20th century, <coughs> whereby someone had the ID, which, is, which was a genius ID, that a change in one volt, the volt being a measure of electricity, would equate a change of one octave. This allowed for the creation of a synthesizer. This allowed a new, a different generation to create a different kind of music, which is what we call pop music. One volt equals one octave. So here we had a, an intersection between electricity, the science of electricity, and musicology. Two entirely disparate fields. Stockhausen and Karl Hans Stockhausen claimed he came up with that idea. What? Synthesizer, pop music, intersection between electricity and musicology. There we go. We're going to look now at something which comes from Judaism. It's a scene called Isaac's Sacrifice. Uh, David, if you could bring up a picture, Isaac number one. So this is the yeah, Caravaggio picture. If you want to take a closer look, so we don't have a projector, maybe next time. And this is what it represents, which is the frame thing, if you can read them, which Dimitri is going to read out. 
and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, even Isaac, and get thee into the land of Moria, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I would tell thee of. There's another one. Hmm? There's another one. Turn the page. So we have God who tells Abraham to take his son Isaac and to bring him over some kind of mountain. Okay. And then, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built the altar fair and laid the wood in order and bide bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou art a God-fearing man, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. Right. So, God tells Abraham, sacrifice your soul to me. Okay. Abraham obeys, no question asked. And then at the very last minute, God says, ah, I was kidding. I was testing you. Right. From our contemporary point of view, sacrificing your son to children <laughs> is something extremely cruel. But in those days, in that area, in the Semitic world, that was an extremely common occurrence. No problem. Okay. And it's represented in the painting here, and it's when Abraham is just about to actually uh, cut his son's throat. There is a very interesting thing in that painting, and in all paintings which represent that biblical scene, even contemporary uh, descriptions paintings, you have here in that corner, hardly noticeable, this little fellow who just happens to be there. It's a ram. Now, it's very small, and there's a very good reason for that. If you know your foreign texts, you know that in a dream, for instance, when you've got something very, very small, <coughs> it means it's damn important. It's just that the censorship turns it around. So this is what we've got there. And of course, uh, as God stops uh, Abraham from sacrificing his son, who gets it? It's that little run there who gets sacrificed in place of a son. And of course, again, by accident, that run was you know, hiding in the bush. Very convenient. So what do we have there? We have a father who offers his son as an object of sacrifice. If you think of the uh, Christian story of the crucifixion, you're not far wrong because it's exactly that except that uh, the son in the Christian scene is very talkative for somebody who is dying on the cross. Whereas in this story, Isaac, the son, doesn't say a word, nothing. He's completely silent. We don't know what he's thinking, we don't know how he's reacting. Nothing. And of course, uh, the ram gets sacrificed, so we have a metaphor already in place, i.e. a continuity by substitution the ram is substituted for Isaac. And that established a rapport between the sacrifice and the divinity. The sacrifice is organized in such a way that it destroys the object, and then the divinity replaces it for you with a gift, such as uh, to make the rain fall, or to destroy your enemies. And this particular sacrifice, the sacrifice of Isaac and Abraham, of which Lacan talks quite a lot throughout his seminars, and that's why I'm using it as an illustration, is very different from the uh, Cain and Abel story. This is a very, very different kind of sacrifice. Um, Cain sacrifices to his God, 
and Scott is very pleased with it. And then Cain's brother, Abel, scratches his head and thinks, how can I better, how can I do something, how can I do something better than the sacrifice given by my brother? I know I'm going to sacrifice the sacrificer. I'm going to sacrifice my brother. And here we have a turnaround because we're not quite sure uh, what this sacrifice of a brother is for. It's very, very obscure. Whereas here we have a much clearer picture. And we talked about the uh, ram because that ram is going to play a very, very important role in everything which has to do with totemism and it's to do with horns. Okay. So, in relation now to the ram, I'm going to talk about a uh, ritual Jewish instrument called the shofar. And we're going to watch the video that's in the video folder, which is called Shofar Blowing 101. And you will see that the shofar is made of the horn of a 